Okay, I'm very uh, happy to have uh, our, our guest speaker today, Michael B. Jones from the Maritime Alliance. Uh, Michael has been kind enough to uh, address some of our previous classes, but we've always done it virtually because he is down in San Diego. He just happened to have been at a, at a, at a meeting up, up in, at UCSB up in Santa Barbara, and so he kindly decided to not get stuck in traffic for several hours and spend some time with us, which we were super appreciative of. I first met him at the Esri conference. How many people have been to the Esri conference? A few. Okay, good. Right, which is, uh, for those of you that, that uh, don't know or haven't taken GIS yet or what have you, that's the company that makes the software that runs the vast majority of, of, uh, of the, the software that runs the vast majority of um, technical analyses, spatial, geospatial analyses, et cetera, um, that we use. They have a huge annual conference every when is it? J July? J July. July. July in, at the, and they always have it at the San Diego Convention Center. And uh, so I was knocking around one day, and he was there, and I was like, what is this? So we started talking, and it was great. And we, uh, uh, that next year, I brought the first group of you guys to, um, we'll hear about this great stuff they're doing, but, but one of the uh, efforts they've done to try to um, foster the blue economy and, and folks thinking about having a dynamic, supportive uh, a coastal and maritime uh, industry here in California and in Southern California uh, um, uh, is, is this effort to do all kinds of outreach. One of those elements is blue, what we now call Blue Tech Week. And uh, the, so, so about half of you guys have indicated that you want to go. So again, we have one trip. Uh, I'd love for you guys to come on both trips, but we have two options. One is up our Central California uh, Coastal Management several day trip. The other is we're going to go down to San Diego and see some examples of coastal management, but primarily go to this uh, a couple day uh, convention um, symposium down in San Diego so we can hear from about all kinds of cool, interesting stuff that I think Michael will probably touch on. Um, I will turn it over to him. So he is the, uh, the guru of the Maritime Alliance. He's the glue that keeps it all together. Um, business, uh, uh, he'll tell us about his background, but, but um, right, background in business, now he's really working with this uh, nonprofit, this foundation to get everything going, this alliance, and, but he's, he's such a serial business guy, he's actually starting his, another new business, which he'll tell us about uh, uh, later on, but, but Michael, Michael Jones. All right. Thank you, Sean. So, uh, one of the reasons I'm here is because I'm hopeful that this region, so, Santa Barbara County and Ventura County might work together and actually develop the kind of model that we'll talk about in a little while. Just to give you a little background, um, I uh, am an investment banker. I help people raise money, buy and sell companies. I'm also an angel investor, and I periodically act as a CFO of companies. Um, and so, um, the, the, I'm going to give you three different presentations. They're each about 180 slides, so <laughs> get ready. It's like one of my talks. <laughs> now, I'll make three different presentations because one I gave in Belgium, one I gave uh, up in Moss Landing, and the other one is going to be about the company that I started. So, I'll give you a little bit of a sense of kind of the breadth of what we do. But what I'd really like to do is start by, by helping you understand that your future really is in the blue economy and blue tech because people don't understand how big it is. And now we're beginning to really, for the first time, understand how dynamic, how big this is. And as we focus on it, hopefully it will get even um, more money and, and, and more companies will grow. So I'm going to, this is a presentation I gave in Belgium in June. And I was there with one of our cluster partners. So this is pretty amazing. I mean, that water's been there a long time, right? We all agree <laughs> the ocean's important. 71% of the world's surface we know is is water. 90% uh, of all goods go by water. The, the statistic that really blows my socks is that 99% of habitable Earth is underwater. So if you just take we humans and all the birds and everything else, we live on terra firma. And they may fly a little bit, but at the end of the day, they come down to eat and sleep on branches. So we're a two-dimensional world. But out there, it's a three-dimensional world. And so if you look at the volume of the ocean, and stuff lives right up and down the water column, that means 99% of habitable Earth is underwater. That's an enormous opportunity for all of us because uh, Sean mentioned the GIS side, and, and Esri has been a real pioneer in, in promoting ocean GIS, which is a whole different topic because you may start small and you get bigger when you get up. So they had to figure out the vectors, if you will. Because again, on, the, on this 
space, you don't have to worry about that kind of thing. When you're talking about the bottom of the ocean, miles down, and then coming back up to the surface, it doesn't come up in one column. So the GIS uh, is just one aspect of this, but we talk about knowing 5 to 10% of the world's ocean, but nobody has a clue how much we really understand. And so what we're finding is when Craig Venter, who was the guy who, who decoded the human DNA, when he went, his boat, the Sorcerer 2, went around the world between 2005 and 2007, we knew about 1.5 million new, li new we, living organisms. So think Darwin. From the time we started capturing that, 1.5 million living organisms. Anybody want to guess how many new organisms they found? They went around the world. They stopped every 200 nautical miles. They tested down to 50 meters. The average depth of the Pacific, 4,200 meters. So this is just a sampling. Now, go around the world, every 200 nautical miles, 50 meters, and then take it back, and count it, and say, God, look at that. How many new living organisms do you think they found? 20 no million. <laughs> 20 million new living organisms. They found new living organisms 80 to 85% every 200 nautical miles. So we're beginning to understand that what lives on the south coast of Portugal versus the Atlantic coast of Portugal versus the Azores is entirely different, which means medicines that may come out of the ocean may be entirely different from what we'll get from one place to another. You know, we've all, most of us seen uh, Finding Nemo, right? And you think that the little fish is going to jump in the water, <laughs> it's going to swim a long way, and it's going to come out, and everything looks the same. I mean, it may be not be a rocky bottom all the time, and, but at the end of the day, all those fish look the same because nobody really understands these microclimates that exist in the ocean. And they don't just exist in the bottom, they exist up and down the water column and things move, you know, just like weather patterns basically. So one of the companies that's, that's uh, spun out of San UC Santa Barbara is actually working on underwater weather. Because if we understand the weather underwater, we'll better understand the weather above the water. So this is, you know, the, the reason it's been so hot here in San Diego, not San Diego, in, in across Southern <laughs> California, is because it's been really hot in the ocean. And that stipulates what's going on on land. So I got into this because I invested in, in a company called Seabotics, which is now part of Teledyne, which is the world's leading uh, ROV company, remotely operated vehicle, so a tethered robot. And I had been looking around and said, gosh, this is interesting. I called a guy that I knew and said, uh, I want to get a hold of these people in, in Scotland. And they said, well, if you care about ROVs, we're coming in San Diego. I had no idea. Um, I was coming at this from a safety and security point of view and ended up investing in the company, ended up being the second largest shareholder. We grew 35% per annum for 10 years, and we sold it. And so then I turned around and bought this, so I was an angel investor in another company, which Teledyne and uh, Lockheed Martin have invested in, and they're doing well. And then kind of got out of that one, I'm still a shareholder, started that one, which we'll talk about as my third presentation. This, that thing with the big wing sail, that is a new way of moving things in the water. So I'm a serial entrepreneur, um, but when I started going to conferences 12 years ago, 13 years ago, I said, why is there somebody coming from San Diego, somebody coming from <laughs> California? Because nobody had ever said to me, oh, there's a lot of companies in San Diego, and I'm very involved in the investment community in San Diego. And what I found was nobody knew that there was a blue tech community in San Diego. Now, think about that. Why does San Diego exist? Because the Navy. And how was it found? By ships, right? Juan Cabrillo found it, found Ensenada, found San Diego, came up the coast. California was found 75 years before the Mayfield flower landed. So California's origin story is older than a lot of the origin story in the East, but we don't think about that. So a city like San Diego was found by ocean. Most people came by ocean. It didn't come by train, didn't come by wagon train. The original people all came, you know, thinking 1849. It was those clipper <coughs> ships that came around, basically. So a town like San Diego was created because of the harbor and because of the Navy, and yet nobody ever studied it. And that's unbelievable. 
And we'll talk a little bit about that. So the OECD, which is this thing, the, uh, is the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development. That is the think tank of the democracies of the world. It's located in Paris. And you look at this date, 2016. This is the first ever study the OECD did on the blue economy. Now, again, we just said it's an old, you know, it's an old <laughs> industry. People have been moving around the water for a long time. It's big. 99% of habitable earth is underwater. Why is it that we're just now beginning to study the ocean? We don't know today in the United States, we do not know how big the blue economy is. Because the way we gather that information from the US government is we go out and we have this thing called, used to be called SIC code, standardized industrial classification. Now it's called NEXT code, the North American Industrial Classification System. When NAFTA came along, so that we would export in one code and they wouldn't import in another code, we had to harmonize those codes. Without getting too deeply into that, that's extraordinarily important. Because if you don't have the right next code, if any of you are getting ready to start a company, or you're in a company, if you don't have the right next code, you may not be able to get a government contract. Because the next code is the way we begin to understand how we're going to allocate uh, investment dollars, how we're going to do labor dollars, how we're going to do Department of Education dollars. And the, the Department of Defense will put out calls for technology based on next code. And yet there is no way for you today to use the next code to find that company, the one we started, and most of the companies in the blue economy. So this is a very complicated issue that I'm not going to go too deeply into, but I want you to understand two things. One is there is a big effort afoot right now in the United States and around the world to begin to understand, to begin to understand the size of the blue economy and blue tech. So this was... Put this in perspective, the worldwide space industry, you know, space, look up, great, you know, <laughs> $355 billion. That's big. There's a lot of investment, there are a lot of investment bankers and there are investment funds that are focused on the space industry. The water and wastewater industry, you know, we all, I've got my water, you know, worry about the waste that goes out to some place to be taken care of. That's about $500 billion. And the OECD came back and said in 2010, conservatively, because they don't really know, because we don't gather the information very well, $1.5 trillion, so three times the size of the water wastewater industry. And they expect it to be $3 trillion by 2030. Now that's faster than almost any other industry in the United States. And they, say, they keep saying conservatively because they're not gathering some of these new industries, because there's no way they know how big they are. But this is really amazing, and so you begin to look at the at the pieces, and about mm, seven years ago, um, a friend of mine, who was the guy who branded Starbucks and Disney stores, he and I were having dinner, and he said, you know, I've got a partner, how about we do some posters for you? And I go, that sounds great, what do I know, right? And they put these unbelievable posters together. I mean, they're just so compelling. So like a, you know, think of a yellow neon jellyfish and a black background, and you go, oh, wow. That, I don't know what it's called, you'll know. But the, the, the anglerfish. The anglerfish. You know, so that's a, kind of a, a, a red fluorescent on a black background, this little thing. And you look at these and you go, oh my god. And now at the bottom it says, uh, your future is in ocean technology. And then the call to action. To learn more, go to. There is no place in the world today that you can go and find about the job. We've got some funding about a year ago. And so we started doing workforce development videos because there's no place you can go find out about jobs. And I actually had, at the Esri conference, I had two mothers walk up to me, a couple years ago now, and say, oh, my son, my daughter wants to be, it's always the same, a marine biologist. It's the only thing that everybody knows. And <laughs> Nothing wrong with marine biologists, I'm just saying. But right. No, of course not. <laughs> we, need, we need a few of them. But, you know, most people will say, I'm going to go into marine biology, because they really don't know hydrography, and they don't know all these other wonderful things that exist out there. Uh, and so one of the things that we're trying to do is, is help people understand not just the size, but the differentiation. There's all these incredible industries that are developing that frankly have been invisible. And so this effort, region by region, nationally and internationally, is extraordinarily important because how do you get a politician's interest? It's Taha Jobs. 
And so if you have no idea how many jobs there are, how do you get their attention? So I'm over at UCSB today, and they're saying, God, we need more money. And I go, yeah, of course you need more. Everyone wants <laughs> more money, right? Everybody. But at the end of the day, if you don't make it relevant for the politician, why are they going to give you more money? So this is, we're now beginning to, to understand this. And this report, we, we, by the way, San Diego, is the only city that's mentioned in this 250-page report because it says the San Diego incubator, because we were in the process of putting an incubator up. Every other place is more regionally, but I thought it was really lovely. So we know the people at the OECD in Paris. They've actually come to speak in San Diego. Um, but this is a very important issue, and for those of you who come to San Diego at Blue Tech Week, this is something that we're gonna touch on in different ways over multiple days. It doesn't mean you have to sit and listen to this, because we're gonna have some private meetings, we're having people from the US government come, because if I look forward five years and 10 years as you are having, creating jobs or your children are creating jobs, um, these kinds of things, if they're not done correctly, have, make an, uh, an enormous impact in how successful companies can be. So that's the work that we're doing as part of this Maritime Alliance. So th this is to start giving you an idea of what the US government is doing now. So in Congress, there is now an ocean caucus in both the Senate and the House, which is really good. They don't, most of them got involved because they're on the water, but they don't necessarily understand the water. <laughs> um, and then the Department of Commerce, we, the Maritime Alliance, that's the organization that I started 12 years ago, and I am the pro bono president. They give me this honor because I don't charge them anything. <laughs> and then we have raised money and we have a full-time executive director, and, and then we have a 80% uh, education person. We're doing a lot of work in education, which I can talk about, um, because we're trying to develop the entrepreneurs of the future and the technical staff that's needed for these companies to continue to grow. But we became a strategic partner with the U.S. Department of Commerce. And the Department of Commerce is that part of the U.S. government that is supposed to help U.S. companies be successful. The State Department takes care of you when your passports are going overseas and, and making sure the trade barriers aren't, aren't high. Department of Defense takes, you know, protects us, et cetera, et cetera. The Department of Commerce is that part that houses essentially three big pieces. One is NOAA, about 50% of its budget. And then the two other pieces, one is the Economic Development Administration, the EDA, and then the ITA, the International Trade Administration. So we are a strategic partner with the Department of Commerce and the International Trade Administration. And they actually created a worldwide team, there's about 80 people in 50 countries, who now focus on maritime technology. That never existed before for the US government. So this is a real advance, and we can take credit for that. And then NOAA is doing its first ever satellite account. That satellite account, we talked a little about next codes. Again, no test here. I'm just <laughs> trying to interest you. I'm trying to give you a sense of how important this is and why we're doing some of the things we're doing. So right now, we every five years, you can put in a proposal to try and change the next code. It's extraordinarily difficult. And you've got to change it across three countries, so it's really complicated to do. But the US government has found a million bucks to really study a satellite account, which is the kind of a first step. And this is really exciting, because they're actually gonna finish this at the end of September, and they're gonna be talking about it at Blue Tech Week. We're very excited. I've gotten funding for the next year, and that means by the end of next year, at Blue Tech, our 11th annual Blue Tech Week, they'll have a lot more information. But this is a stepping stone to changing the next code. This is the first time the US government will ever really have an understanding of how big Blue Tech is. Now, by, mind you, this is, even defining what blue tech is is interesting, because <laughs> we are a, and I'll talk about this in a minute, but we focus on both water and ocean technology. Not everybody includes both of those in there. So the U.S. Commercial Service, which is part of that thing I mentioned, the International Trade Administration, so this is like a hierarchy, right? You know, the Secretary of Commerce, and then there's these pieces, and then you get down to more... Uh, the working offices of so the Internet, U.S. Commercial Service is 2,500 people around the world whose job it is to help U.S. companies export. And that's the one that has created this worldwide team back in 2010. And so we, about once a year, once every two years, will get on a phone call with people around the world, talk about what they're working on, what we're working on, how we're helping companies. So we also received two years ago funding from the U.S. government to do the first ever, and this is amazing, you know, again, we talk about this big industry. The United States government has never focused on maritime technology before in terms of exports. So we receive funding, it's three year funding, we're in our second year now, and we look all across the United States for innovative companies. We don't care where they are. 
Uh, it, to us, it's, it's just finding great companies and helping support them. So that's just the Department of Commerce, Department of, of Defense. I'm going to be talking to the Naval War College in, in October. Department of Labor has begun to give out some educational grants. Again, this is, this is like the wedge, right? You know, you've got to start somewhere. Uh, and, and so if, if you don't get your foot in the door, if they don't understand why this is important, if you don't do the research, if you don't start having case studies of success, then why should they bother? Why should they do the next grant? So this is really important. This is the beginning of, a, we think, a wave. Sorry for this analogy, Deb. Anyway, it's, it's, it's incredibly important. Department of State, we've worked with the Office of Ocean and Polar Affairs, the European desk, um, and then the Small Business Administration gave a grant to uh, Mississippi um, to really create a cluster. So this thing I'm going to talk to you about in a minute in terms of clusters, the U.S. government is, you know, it's like a battleship, right? It takes a long time to turn. So in this case, you're getting different departments to understand this blue economy. What's that blue economy? What's blue tech? And now they're beginning to understand. They're going, oh, that sounds kind of cool. And just to stop for a second, in San Diego, there was a study uh, done on, economic study done about two years ago, three years ago. And we have a problem that many uh, cities have, which is the barbell effect. You have a lot of tourism jobs that are less well paid, and you have a lot of white collar jobs that are quite well paid, you know, telecom, in San Diego, biotech, things like that. One of the great industries is the ocean industry, because whether you're talking about the traditional blue economy, a stevedore, a tugboat operator, uh, a cargo ship uh, hand, um, a crane operator, they're working, they're working really well. And then you get all these companies, when you're going to put something down the bottom of the ocean, the last thing he wants is for that to fail. You know, you spend a lot of time, a lot of money, getting a boat, putting it out, put it down 100 meters or 1,000 meters, and it fails. And you go, oh my God, you know, I'm not going to buy from him again, ever. That's different. You can go put it, take a helicopter and put it out in the middle of the desert, you know, it cost you $2,000 or $5,000. That's different from putting it down a long way. So the you don't want turnover, so you're, you're paying people better. So the blue economy, blue tech and the traditional blue economy is a really great place, so I try and get economic development people to understand that, because it's just not like mother, most other industries, and they, most of them just have no idea. And, and so for, I'll just interject right here and say, we'll see this in many different, we've already started to see this, but if you don't measure the stuff, right, if, you don't, if you're not quantifying whatever it is, the amount of wind the hurricane has, the amount of value this job has, you cannot, it, it's, it's, you might as well not try to make the argument for improving the management, improving the state of affairs. So this theme of, of communicating to folks and documenting the condition is ubiquitous that we need to do throughout the coastal and marine uh, environment. Absolutely Sorry. true. No, it's absolutely true because if, if you can't measure it, then how do you solve it? How do you change it? I mean, you've got to understand the problem first before you can change it. Otherwise, you begin to change things blindly, and you, you, know, you change one thing and it impacts another thing. So always understanding the issue, not necessarily a problem, is number one. And we're going to talk about, this is us. This is the Maritime Alliance. And we are an industry association, and we are a cluster organizer. I'll explain what a cluster is in a few minutes. And we talk about this thing called the triple helix. So we believe that the way to save the ocean um, is more complicated than don't touch my ocean. That's just not going to work because other countries aren't going to do that even if we decided to do it. And every decision we take, you know, the clothes we wear, this, you know, what we eat, everything is a compromise, right? I mean, we went out there and, and we tilled the soil and we killed worms, you know, we were growing things that something else naturally grew there before. So we got rid of something indigenous to put something cotton there, whatever it was. It's the same thing in the ocean. We're always talking about compromise. So what we really have to do is balance what's sustainable with economic development. And it's not, it should not be a question about, oh, I'm, I'm a Democrat and I all care only about conservation, or I'm a Republican, and I'm not saying they do this. But there is a generalization that, that, that on one side they're pro-business, the other side they're pro-environment. And, and that's, not, that's a false analogy. We have to be thinking about the long-term sustainability. And so our mission statement is to promote sustainable science-based ocean and water industries. So this is critical for us. Everything we do has to have a sustainability aspect to it. 
It has to be science-based, otherwise we shouldn't do it. We don't know how to replicate it. And for us, I, I told you already, we're both ocean and water industries. We are right now about 95 members, about 60 uh, of those are Southern California, about 30, I'm gonna add up to 100, but 30 of those are across the United States and about 10 are international. So we have one member in Brazil, uh, Italy, Canada, uh, Portugal, Spain, France, South Africa, I'm missing somebody. But we're doing that because we are opening doors around the world. We're helping create linkages, creating collaboration in many places. Our tagline is promoting blue tech and blue jobs. So this was uh, in June. Um, we actually began our 12th year in January of this year. So um, what's blue tech for us? Again, I'm just going to give you our definition. Somebody else will give you a different definition. But to us, blue, blue tech is extraordinarily broad. It's from aquaculture to weather and climate change. So marine recreation, I'm not talking about the companies that rent you the sailboats, but Hobie Cat is doing really innovative technology. We have a member that, that makes um, uh, water parks, but they make a, um, uh, the world's best, um, what do I call them, surf park. And that's a real technology. In fact, people have repurposed that technology into doing ocean energy. University of Texas bought something from them. So these are technology companies across, in our case, 16 sectors and over 80 subsectors. We believe that blue tech is what is allowing us to find the problems that we humans have created. Now think about it. We talk about plastic, it's a big problem. That's the most obvious, visible problem. I mean, we can see it along the coast. We see the pictures of the, of the, the gyre. But we've been throwing stuff in the ocean forever. The Vikings, if they were being attacked, they'd go out and hack a hole in a boat and it would try and, and they'd try and, 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 and stop the invaders from coming in. After the First World War, we took most of the chemical weapons and threw them into the water. We have thrown atomic energy into the water. Again, it, we humans are, we, we, we think and we see and therefore why we think that's the problem. But there are lots of problems. And I'll give you just a couple of examples. But we think it's blue tech that's allowing us to understand, again, back to Sean's point, we don't understand, how can you act? So we now can go to the bottom of the Marianas Trench, not just once, we can go down there with, with, with robots today, you know, the, the James Cameron going down there, that's cool, but we can get down there other ways today. You know, maybe not the human that wants to go down, you know, corkscrew down and come back up, and there are people in San Diego that basically kept him safe as he was doing that. But I like to give an example, but I know that Sean likes quadcopters, and, <laughs> and one of the things that, that, um, that we found is when you fly, when you fly through the spume of, of, a, of a whale, you can gather it. Now you can't go lasso a whale like you can lasso a, a spear or something. You know, bring it down and you know, pull some blood and go see if there's a problem. But we began to realize that there's human hormones in these whales. So if we didn't use technology, how would we know that? We can't just walk to them and say, please, would you give me a little, you know, stick out your tongue. So we're using, in this case, technology to, to find that. We're finding things up and down the water column. It's not like they just happened, you know, in the last five years. They've been happening over really a long time. It's so we can find them now. We can begin to understand what the problem is. And blue tech is the only way we're going to answer those problems. We have a company up in uh, the Bay Area that uh, we haven't seen this yet, but I have no reason to believe that's not the case. Um, that they can go out and they can take plastic in situ. So there's this company that's raised $20 million, a Dutch company, the Ocean Cleanup. It's gotten a lot of publicity. They've tried different things, haven't been as successful. So now out of San Francisco, they've got this long boom. They're gonna go out and they're gonna gather this. And the idea is to bring it back to shore. Well, we don't have a lot to do with on shore. And that means we're using fuel to get out there and get stuff back. Well, what, why not get away, turn that into a useful thing in situ, there. And so this company can actually turn the plastic um, back into fuel. Guess what? The US Navy is really interested in that because that means they don't have to move, move fuel. So I got asked by some people in the Disruptive Technology Laboratory at Carter Rock if we could help them find a way to find fuel, for example. So here's a company 
that have developed this. They didn't develop it under U.S. Navy contracts. They just developed themselves because they thought it was the right thing to do. They can address a very real problem. So that's just one problem. So these are the kinds of things. Blue Tech is allowing us to do ocean observation to understand problems that we've created over long periods of time. Uh, and and one of the things that's interesting about ocean observation isn't it, it isn't one time. You know, out here you do a survey, and that survey could be good for 40 or 50 years. But you all know that sand moves, seaweed grows rapidly. <laughs> so things are constantly changing in a three-dimensional world as opposed to in a two-dimensional world. So this is, for example, there are a lot of surveyors of the sea, and there will be more of them. Because that's the kind of thing that you don't do it just once. And as we get to know the ocean more and more, because we have to, that is our future. I like to tell people of the big five issues for humans, it is the ocean that will provide us with the answers. And what are those? Number one is food. Over 90% of all the terra firma that could be under agriculture already is. The other 10% is in a place it's hard to get to, really hard to get to. So how do you go from four and a half billion people to nine and a half or 10 billion people? How do you create the protein for those people? You can get a little bit more efficient, but the only way is to get it out of the ocean. Number two is water. Do you know how much water, uh, fresh water there is on, on land that we can get to? Out of the 100% of all water in the world, 0.8%, only less than 1% is on land, and, and half of that is not in aquifers that replenish. So only 0.4% really replenishes on a reasonably constant basis. And even that can be overused. So we're talking about water is one of those big issues. 97% of the world's water is in the ocean. And then a certain amount is in glaciers, although that may not be the same percentage that much longer. But at the end of the day, most of that is in the, water, is in the ocean. So the only way we get enough water for the people around the world, which is billions of people who don't have access to good water, is by desalinating. Medicines, I gave you the example of Craig Venter going around the world and finding 20 million new living organisms. Those organisms, uh, and on during Blue Tech Week, we are going to have a, uh, a renowned scientist will speak to talk about um, biomimicry from the ocean. So finding things that Mother Nature has spent billions of years creating and he, we've asked him, we challenged him to talk about new industries and new technologies that will come out of that biomimicry from the ocean. So when you think about aquaculture and you think about all these medicines that come out to the biomarine, it's, that part is really important. Then energy, the U.S. Department of Energy looking at just what they call harvestable wind energy off the U.S. coast versus the whole energy that we use in the United States. They said there was three times the amount of harvestable energy on our coast than we use the whole United States. Just wind energy off our coast. One of our companies just got the first contract for the state of California, up near Eureka. And the president of that company sits on our board of directors. This is really exciting. They got an investment from a Norwegian company. So one of the fastest growing jobs in the United States is a turbine uh, technician because both on land and eventually in the sea. Some of our graduates have gone into that. Our guys like to climb because uh, it, was, it turned out to be easier to teach the climbers the engineering than to teach engineers how to climb. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> so I've gone through four of those, which is food, water, medicine, and energy. And the fifth one is real estate. Now you think about it, and the way that we will move back from the coast will be basically insurance because it's really hard for an elected official to tell somebody, I'm sorry, <laughs> you gotta move that house or you can't rebuild there. That's really hard to do. They won't be reelected. So insurance companies will do that. They'll just say, I'm sorry, if you wanna rebuild there, the insurance is no longer $10,000 a year, it's $100,000 a year. And people will get the idea and they'll say, oh, that's not worth doing. But everything that needs water, every power plant, every desal plant, Every harbor that sits on sea level or water has to move. So we're going to have to be thinking about floating infrastructure. This whole area of policy, law, 
uh, technology related to floating infrastructure that we think is extraordinarily important. So those big five, the only way we deal with those is with blue tech. So again, as you all get older and, and as you have children, as I have my first grandchild, you know, I'm thinking really for him and you know, for my next grandchildren, I'm hoping for some more. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I mean, what I'm doing is, is really for the next generation. This is, we're investing for the future. So having all of you here and hearing that Sean's group is, is growing, I think is fabulously important. And, and there's, it's hard to say this work is more important than let's say, you know, healthcare, because it's not. But I can tell you that, that um, it is as important and in some ways, again, you know, if you care about water and you care about food and you care about medicine, it's pretty important. <laughs> so, you know, if you walk away today, I hope you'll say, wow, that was, you know, provoking. Um, because at the end of the day, this industry, this ocean economy is huge and is growing very rapidly. So data allows us to understand the impacts and change behaviors and this big five we just talked about. And then part of this is international collaboration. And I was giving this talk to a group in Belgium. So this is Blue Tech Week. How many of you are going to San Diego to Blue Tech Week? Well, lucky you. So um, we do seven events in five days, but the first event is um, a uh, Blue Tech clusters. Last year we had 18 clusters from 11 states and seven, sorry, 11 countries and seven US states. This year we'll have more. Um, last year we had 486 unique uh, visitors. This isn't a trade show. You don't just walk up and you know get some hand handouts. This is high level networking. This is we'll have the we'll have the administrator from NOAA. We'll have the chief scientist from NOAA. We'll have the director general from from Fisheries Canada. We've got the woman who's in charge of of maritime policy for the Ministry of the Sea from Portugal. You invited the Minister of the, of the Economy for, for uh, Mexico under the new president, Lopez Obrador. We don't know if she's coming yet, but she's already, she came to one of our events just when she got elected, he got elected, and she's very interested in the blue economy and blue tax, so we're excited about that. Uh, we'll have over 100 companies. Last year we had 95. Uh, last year we had 16 countries. This year we're expecting 20 plus. Um, and then last year, the, our fifth day, um, so the first day is, is our Blue Tech Day. The second day is a day that we're doing with Scripps Institution Oceanography. That's focused on marine, marine debris solutions. We're not going to talk about the problem. We know there's problems. Whether it's hydrocarbons in the water, abandoned netting, we care about the solutions. So what we're going to our speakers will be people that are working in four areas. One will be hydrocarbon cleanups. One will be plastic cleanups. One will be um, unexploded uh, ordnance, so sh uh, weapons or shells, uh, and um, abandoned vessels. Sometimes in the Second World War when they were torpedoed, 40, 50 years later, we're finding they still have 100,000 gallons of diesel on them, and it's ruining whole reefs. So how do we find them? How do we safely um, remove that? And the fourth one is abandoned netting, uh, which is a big issue. So that's Tuesday. And then Wednesday, Thursday is our traditional Blue Tech uh, Expo and Summit. And then that evening we do our gala dinner. That's Wednesday evening. And that was the guy I told you about. He's the world renowned scientist working on biomimicry. And then Friday we have our Blue Tech Investor Day. So that's over here. And that's will be the third year that we're doing that. Now, the European Union just did its first ever Blue Invest Day hmm. in June. Hmm. So we're excited. I mean, obviously we're excited, we're ahead of them, but we're really excited that they're doing this. Because there is not one, and I hope one of you changes this, today there is, there is not one investment firm really focused on blue tech in the United States. There are people focused on water, there are people focused on space, but not one focused. So if any of you have really rich relatives, or <laughs> your parents, or yourself, this is an enormous area where you can make money investing and, and do the triple bottom, bottom line. This is really important stuff. So that's Blue Tech Week. So I told you a little bit about the triple helix. This is where we live, right here in the middle. And it is critically important, we believe, to create what we call a blue voice. 
The only way you do that is to make sure that you're bringing different constituencies together, because we live in silos. I think we all know that. And in this case, we try and work with academia and education. We coined this phrase, uh, ocean stem, blue stem, and we got these, I think I started to tell you the story of these posters, and, and um, at the bottom it says, um, your future is, and go to, and there was no place to send them to. And at the time, we said oceanstem.org, so we reserved that name. But now what we're going to do is we're going to have, we're going to call it bluestem bluestemjobs.org. Um, so for us, it's really important to, um, sorry, bluetechjobs.org, that's what's going to be, bluetechjobs.org, because we don't want to leave out the traditional industry. So then you bring industry in, and then you've got to bring all those people related to policy. And the reason this is so important is, you know, in order for this university to get more funding for this kind of work, somebody's got to say, okay, you're producing students that are important for this economy. They don't know how big the economy is, of course, you get into conflict. So each of these pieces becomes really important. But if you bring these people together and you show them the size of the industry, you begin to show them the, the success stories, they get really excited. Because, as I said, this is one of those industries that isn't just high wage, low wage. It happens in a lot of places, not just San Diego. But to get a good paying blue collar job is hard. And this industry produces that. So it's, it's like an economic development person's dream. So that's what we do. And all the companies that we, all the organizations we deal with sit at that intersection. So we, last year, in January of 2017, started this thing called the Blue Tech Cluster Alliance. And it's obviously got to be mutually beneficial, and we now have uh, 10 clusters from eight countries. Now these are leading clusters from around the world, and they have the similar kinds of issues. They're triple helix oriented, so they're working with their universities, their education system, K through 12 and on. Um, they're working with their industry, their industry associations like us. They're dealing with their governments, their courts, just like we are. And if I want to help a US company, then, and when you know that most of the sales, Seabotics I mentioned to you, that was the company that I was the CFO of, 50% of their sales were international. And many of the companies that become our members, their first sale may be international. So how can I best help those companies? Because I don't know everybody in France, I don't know everybody in Norway, I don't know everybody in Portugal, but my partner does. And so what we've done is create this mutual re relationship um, to work together. So that's the Blue Tech Cluster Alliance, the first uh, in the world. Um, here are some examples. This was, again, I was giving a presentation in Belgium, and I wanted them to understand how we're working together. So Acker Solutions is a Norwegian company. They invested in this company I told you about, Principal Power, which happens to be a Bay Area company, um, and they're the company that got the first contract for offshore wind in the state of California. ASV is a, a UK unmanned surface vessel company. They're working with one of our companies called Plank Aerosystems. Plank is really exciting. I think I've told Sean about this company. One of the problems when you, when you take off and land, again, it's pretty easy on terra firma because it doesn't move very much, unless there's an earthquake going on. But <laughs> when you go on, out on the ocean and you're bobbing along, you know, and you're doing this, and, and you're trying to land this thing, and you're trying to stay steady, that's really hard. The guy who started Plank Aerosystems um, worked for the US Navy as a helicopter pilot. And so he figured out how to take this technology and bring it down so that any off the shelf um, quadcopter can now take off and land from a moving vessel or a moving truck. So now CBP is interested in this. So they can put an eye in the sky. They don't have to stop and wait until they get it back down again. Likewise, all these vessels. So this is as important to Navy SEALs as it is to as it is to um, fishermen. Because if you can go up and you can look down, and there are these telltale signs. So if you see seaweed, that's where the fish hide. Or you see the birds diving into the water, you go, oh, I know there's fish there, because they're not diving for their health, they're di you know, to, to bathe, they're diving to go get, eat something. So now you can reduce the amount of, of diesel they use, often reduce the amount of time they go out. They can't capture any more fish, because it's all regulated. So now they come back hopefully half a day early. They can have a real life. And one of the things we're having is we're losing too many captains. We're, we're, our uh, fishing fleet is reducing partially because it's a really difficult 
job. Anything we can do to make it easier for them, that's good. All right? So here's a company that developed the technology, and now this company, ASV, UK company, is putting it on so it can take off and land from their autonomous vehicles. This is a Spanish company that's figured out a way to, to dissipate the water from when you, when you uh, desalinate, you create this very briny water. And they can reduce that 80 to 90 percent. So we have introduced them to the largest desal plant in the Western Hemisphere, which is one of our members. Fugro is a Dutch company, again, working with Planck Aero System. Um, I assume most of you know what hydrography is. So when you're going through, uh, what they found was if you put an eye in the sky, when you're going through islands and things, the traditional way to do it was you put a camera and you take a picture of the islands you're going by and then you do your soundings and then you try and stitch them together. Well, it turns out if you put that eye in the sky and it looks down, it gets far more detail and they can go about four or five times as fast. So NOAA can do a lot more hydrographic work than they could have done before. So these two companies met at Blue Tech Week, I think two years ago now, and they're working together. MERS is the largest uh, freighter company in the world. And this company is a Boston-based company, Sea Machine and Robotics, uh, that we helped get some funding for. And they're doing AI for cargo ships. So every single one of these is an example like this. So here I am in front of a bunch of companies in Belgium. They're trying to say, who is this guy from San Diego? <laughs> Who's this, what's this Maritime Alliance? So I've got to explain to them. And I'm also trying to convince them that they should create a cluster there. They put a little one together, but we are if you cut my veins, you'd see cluster of blood come out. <laughs> because I believe so fervently that that is the way that we save the ocean. It's not to just say, you know, don't touch my ocean. It's not just conservation. It's got to be everybody that agrees that you, we're going to compromise in a way that makes the most sense. Right? So that's why our mission statement is to promote sustainable science-based ocean and water industry. So this is, to me, a great example and I was just trying to show them that this isn't just San Diego and we're the only people benefiting. I'm showing them from around the world, people, people are benefiting by the work that we're doing together. This was a particular case. I already talked a little bit about it, so it increased the accuracy and the speed of hydrographic work. Oh, the other thing that they did, and actually this is right here, was um, the state of California had long been interested in finding, um, every once in a while, oil would bubble up, and most of you have been to the red tar pits, and so there are places there's natural seepage, and then there are places, particularly not too far from here, where there are capped wells. And they didn't know whether or not what was natural and what was uh, a capped well that was leaking. And so there was no good way to do this from the surface. You know, how do you find it, you know? So they started working together, these two companies, they did a pilot program, and that's turned into, I think, $2.3 million a year, mandated by um, State Lands Commission in order to understand the seepage. Because again, if you can't measure it, then you don't know where it is, and then you can't tell if it's going to have a bigger leak, leak. So these are, this to me is really wonderful because you've got a big multi-billion dollar services company taking a very innovative U.S. company technology, and then you turn it into revenue and real services that make sense. That, that's, that's it. It's not just a great idea. It's not talking pie in the sky. You're talking about really getting something done that makes all of our lives better. Because you don't want that car rolling up on, you know, getting on your bathing suit. I don't want it on my clothes. I don't want my, my towel. So the more we understand, the better we can control it. So I love this quote um, out from Proverb. You know, if you want to go quickly, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And that really is the Maritime Alliance. We are all about collaboration. So what I'm going to do now, if I may, if you're going to hang with me, because I think I have, what, three more hours, Dr. Yeah, exactly. 